displayed. Raucous cheers as another sworn noble man or noble woman is put unjustly or justly to death. And don't get me wrong, as a French historian, I love this stuff too. When uh, I was an undergraduate and uh, then as a graduate student, I ate this stuff up. I actually own a CD of revolutionary songs. If anyone's interested in Saïha and, and the Marseillaise and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I know what day it is on French Revolutionary Calendar. If anyone's interested, it is the 28th of Pluvius 223 of the French era. They have their own calendar. We'll get to that. But the French Revolution is one of the most studied periods in history. There are literally, and here's this slide, thousands and thousands of books that have been written on this topic. So why is that? Why is this such an important topic for historians? Part of the answer is in the title of your talk, which is that it was, in fact, a day that shook the world. Are you still having a competition? Uh, we have not formally announced the competition. No. But you were thinking of it? Yes. Okay. So you, can, you can let... Uh... Can, can I make the announcement? So I am making a bid for your vote that this was, in fact, the most important day that shook the world. That here I'm going to argue that the French Revolution was the birth of the modern era. Okay? It enshrined the notion of <coughs> national popular sovereignty, the idea that the people, and not one individual, is sovereign. Okay? It's the birth of our modern political system as well, and of popular involvement in politics. That's huge. English historians try to say it's them, but it's not really. The Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, which we'll also talk about, uh, was promulgated by the French National Assembly in August of 1789. It established many of the principles that we still live by today. The English Bill of Rights preceded it by a century, but it only proclaimed the rights of Englishmen. It was not universal rights. And the U.S. Bill of Rights was actually afterwards. It was 1790, and it was actually a collection of afterthoughts that followed the Constitution, rather than a document that set up the basic principles on which the Constitution would be based, which is what the French Declaration was. The United Nations Declaration of Human Rights is based on the French Declaration of Rights. Uh, 14 of its 30 articles are taken directly from 1789 principles, uh, and some of them are taken verbatim from that document. So, before we get into specifics, let's first look at what the revolution was replacing. So, if July uh, 14, 1789 shook the world, I'm going to show you first what that world was that it shook. So, 18th century France was, in political terms, an absolute monarchy. King Louis XVI was the successor of the most splendid absolute monarch Europe had ever seen, Louis XIV, the Sun King. Now, in theory, in an absolute monarch, monarchy, excuse me, the king shares power with nobody. He is answerable to nobody but God. That's what absolute monarchy means. He has absolute control. In affairs of state, uh, finance, foreign affairs, all of these are his private domain. He can do whatever he likes. Louis XIV is famous for having said, the state is me. I am the state. What I decide goes. Um, in all things, an absolute monarch is sovereign in the sense that his decisions are final. So sovereign meaning that, that power, that control. Louis XIV adopted the image of the sun god, Apollo, as his personal emblem. So he envisioned himself in this symbolic way. He was at the center. Everything revolved around him. His power was benevolent. Right, as the sun gives us light and warmth, but absolute, and his power radiates outwards and it touches every corner of his kingdom. As far as he's concerned, every corner of the world. But in 1789, less than 75 years after Louis XIV died in 1715, we see this great edifice of absolute monarchy come crashing down. The king is overthrown, and the people claim to be sovereign in his place. How could this happen? So two things really explain how this could have fallen apart so soon after this great sun king. For one thing, society had changed quite a bit since Louis XIV's time. The 18th century is a fairly busy period in European history. And the end of the 18th century sees a series of crises that his great-grandson, Louis XVI, would not be able to resolve successfully. So, a series of crises. The immediate cause of the breakdown of government at the end of the 1780s was a fiscal crisis. So a crisis in state revenue, money. <coughs> now, of course, this is a common enough problem in times of revolution. In the case of France, what we have is huge debt. Okay? The government is in debt. That debt is inherited from wars that go back nearly a century, uh, and especially from the War of U.S. Independence, sort of the tipping point, uh, where the French fought on the American side, mostly to annoy the British. There's a long history of them doing that. Um, but they didn't really have the money to get involved. They just felt they had to. 
But spending and this debt is only part of the fiscal crisis. The real problem is that the tax system is both inefficient in the way it collects money from wealthy people, and it's also corrupt. Okay? The property owned by the church and by the nobility is exempt from taxation. So the richest people in society in many ways, and the ones that have a lot of land, don't pay tax on that land. So you're taxing people who don't have the wealth of the country. So we have a tremendous proportion of the wealth in France. In some places, the church owns as much as 30% of the land in certain areas, uh, and yet it's privileged. They don't pay taxes on it. And as I said, it's also corrupt. The situation is not helped by the fact that the tax collection system is inefficient, and those who uh, are tax collectors actually own their positions. They, they, they sort of um, have it as a form of property or as a form of revenue that they can count on, which means they're skimming off the top. But it's the exempt property, that property that's exempt from taxation, that the royal finance ministers concentrate on when they're trying to solve the problem. Over and over again, the last 20 years of the old regime, a succession of finance ministers try to reform the tax system, but they're always defeated. Defeated by whom? The, re the answer to that is the nobles themselves. These people who are exempt from taxation hold a degree of political power. Um, they sit on something called the Parlement. The word I put up here, where's my flashy thing? There it is. I don't see it at all. The word, the small word there, Parlement. So the Parlement is a Supreme Court, and they have positions on the Supreme Court. One of the jobs of that Supreme Court is to register the king's edicts into law. Okay? The king pronounces an edict, uh, puts forward some legislation. And if the Parliament doesn't like it, they can refuse to register it. And they don't like the idea of being taxed. Now by 1786, or three years before the kickoff of the revolution, the interest on the national debt accounts for more than 50% of government expenditure. The interest on the debt is more than 50% of their expenditure. So in 18th century financial terms, you're not allowed to borrow any more money at that point. That is the official cutoff point. So we have a crisis. Now, on its own, this problem probably could have been resolved, but there's two deeper-seated problems here, social and political unrest that go along with it. Now, for one thing, the organization of society is out of date with the economic and political realities of the regime. Legally, France is still organized into estates or orders. Okay? So these are social groups, sections of society, a hierarchy, that correspond roughly to professions or to, to to parts of the society. So the first estate is called those who pray, the clergy. Okay, the first estate is the clergy. The second estate, those who fight, that's the nobility. And the third is everybody else. Critics of the system called it those who work, assuming that the clergy and the nobility weren't doing a whole lot of work. Okay? Now, in feudal times, that division made sense. And each group did the job that was ascribed to them. You had the peasants tilling the fields, and you had the nobles who were protecting them, and you had the clergy who were praying for their souls, and everybody agreed to their situation. But by the late 18th century, that system of orders no longer corresponds to reality. Okay? The economy has grown, and that third estate that encompasses everyone else, from the poorest farmers to wealthy merchants and lawyers, has expanded a great deal. Now, these wealthier members of the third estate are fed up. Okay? They have worked hard. They have a lot of wealth and a lot of knowledge and education. And they want a political voice in government that matches what they see as their status in society. And yet, only the king uh, and a few nobles have that kind of political power. They want to share that political power. This is a common uh, caricature, the people <laughs> under the old regime. So this is showing us um, the, uh, it's actually a little bit more of a diverse caricature, uh, very common right before the revolution. It's technically showing us the three estates. We have, here's the people down here who are doing all the work and who are emaciated. Uh, we have the nobleman here with his riding crop and all of his uh, riding finery. Uh, here we have uh, our bishop, member of the clergy. This guy over here is actually a judge, so he's representing the wealthier of the third estate. This is an even sort of more radical cartoon that says, even the wealthy of the third estate are oppressing the poor. Okay. So this is this is the problem. We have a state that's broke. We have nobles who don't want to pay taxes, who are blocking fiscal reform from that entrenched position they have in the parliament. And the kind of political power that they have is exactly what the wealthy commoners want, and they're shut out of. Now, 
I said there were two deeper seated problems. One of them was a social crisis. The other one is a political crisis. Okay, because to steer through these rough waters, unfortunately, France did not have a very strong leader at the helm of this ship. Neither Louis XV nor Louis XVI could hold a candle to Louis XIV. Uh, Louis XV was considered lazy and indifferent when it came to matters of state, although he showed plenty of vigor when he was chasing new mistresses, where all, uh, all historians are, are apt to point out. Uh, his reputation suffered quite a bit when he lost the Seven Years' War, and pamphlet writers had a heyday with his image. They spread scandal and pictures that he was a leper who, the rumor was, he was a leper who was having children kidnapped off the streets of Paris so that he could bathe in their blood to cure his leprosy. Okay, so this is not, you know, a very strong king who's allowing this to be said about him. Louis XVI, who's pictured here, was a well-meaning man, uh, but he wasn't much interested in governing. Okay, this is an example of where hereditary leadership sometimes gets the wrong person. Uh, he was really a tragic figure. He was in his 20s when he became king, uh, and he was hesitant and naive. He actually preferred puttering around the castle and hunting and doing carpentry. His personal favorite pastime was taking clocks and watches apart to see how they worked and putting them back together. So this is the man who was at the helm of the most populous country in Europe at a time of a major crisis. That's a problem. His image was not helped by his queen, right? The famous Marie Antoinette, nothing like the movie, I'm telling you right now. Um, she was an Austrian princess, so a foreigner, uh, very haughty, very conscious of her superior rank, and she became embroiled in all kinds of scandals. And attention to scandals and frivolity at court was not what the French monarchy needed with this fiscal crisis on its hands. At one point, one of the finance ministers, a Swiss banker by the name of Jack Necker, uh, tried to improve the financial situation by, first of all, um, uh, abolishing hundreds of useless offices in the royal household. Among the newly unemployed were aristocratic cup bearers, salt passers, and candle snuffers. So these are some of the people that had been paid by the monarchy to do small jobs around the castle and that he fired. And then he published the expenses of the royal court, made them public, including 28 million livres in unearned pension that had just been handed out by the king. Needless to say, Necker was not very popular with the king that day. So again, inefficient spending and the political crisis were nothing new, but a new element is emerging in the 18th century that hadn't been there in the 16th century or the 17th century. And that new element is a receptive public. This was a public that was more educated, and they had been reading the works of the Enlightenment, uh, the political criticism of people like Montesquieu, the scathing satire of people like Voltaire, um, basically the 18th century equivalent of tabloid writers as well. Okay, so a lot of people who are publishing things like that leprosy scandal, who are making a lot of how much money Marie Antoinette spends, and who are criticizing the government, and they're undermining confidence in the government. Just like today, the scandalous lives of the rich and famous are being put under the microscope, and with growing literacy and an exploding market for print material, ideas are circulating. Uh, one influential book on the French Revolution written by a historian uh, asks a question, okay, sure, so all of this stuff was circulating, but do books make revolutions? You know, books by themselves don't make revolutions, but they do undermine loyalty, and they undermine uh, the confidence that people have in a ruler. So they create doubt. They make people start thinking about whether or not that system really is uh, what they need. When crises intersect, and when the government grinds to a halt, they produce a public that is receptive to change. So that's the atmosphere we have on the eve of the French Revolution. Now, the revolution as we know it, though, didn't get kicked off right away. Um, of all the crises I just described, it's the financial crisis that becomes critical first, as you can imagine. It's the fact that they can't borrow any more money. So by 1786, they're in this position. They have to tax the nobility and the church, right? They have no choice. That's where the wealth is in the kingdom that is being not taxed currently. Now, if the king had just gone ahead and announced a tax, he would have had a noble rebellion on his hands. The government would have ground to a halt. Okay? And he doesn't have enough gumption to take that on. A Louis XIV probably could have done it. Louis XVI, not so much. So they try to go through legal channels to make this change, to get the taxation uh, put onto the noble and the church lands. Um, the Parlement, remember that Supreme Court that has to register laws? They refuse to register any decrees about it. So the finance minister tries a special hand-picked assembly of notables 
uh, and that falls apart too. So he tries a different kind of group of important people to put a rubber stamp on it. Finally, the Parlement, that group that's been blocking it, has a proposal. They say, let's call the Estates General. Now, this is significant. The Estates General is a sort of ad hoc advisory body to the king. In recent years, it had fallen into disuse. Um, but in times of crisis, the theory is, is that the king can call uh, a meeting and delegates from all three estates. That's why it's called the Estates General. So the first estate, the clergy, the second, the nobility, and the third estate, everybody else. Delegates from all three of those estates would be elected to gather the grievances of their constituents and bring them together for a discussion, essentially to advise the king on how to solve the problem from their particular perspective of the kingdom. But it hasn't been called since 1614, so almost 175 years. The kings of France have had this pretension of being absolute, right? Louis XIV was an absolute monarch. So one of the things they did was they said, I'm not calling the Estates General. I have no limits on my power. I don't need advice. I don't need counsel. They're not going to allow any kind of constraint on what they want to do. So the Parlement thinks that this is a good idea. Let's call up this, this old body that hasn't met for a long, long time. Why would they think that's a good idea? Surely the third estate, all of those people who've been paying the lion's share of the taxes are going to vote, yeah, let's tax the nobility and the clergy. But the problem is, is that there's this very old-fashioned voting procedure in the Estates General, and the Parlement knows that. Even though 95% of the population is in the third estate, that everybody else who works, about 25 million people, voting at the Estates General is by estate. One estate, one vote, right? So the clergy gets one vote, the nobility gets one vote, and those 25 million people get one vote. So the Parlement figures that the first two estates, the nobility and the clergy, will naturally outvote the third. They'll vote to not be taxed. And this taxation thing will finally be dealt with once and for all, and it will be dealt with in a way that gives it a sense of finality. Because now we've consulted the whole country, and we've gone through the traditional legal channels, and it's dead. So they think it's a way to kill it. This is a really exciting time, as everyone gets ready for the estates, and here's why. Part of the process involves asking every community of the land every town and village to draw up grievances, what they call the cahier de doléances. So they're like notebooks of grievances, okay? Um, they do this, and we actually have about 80,000 of them that still exist. 80,000 lists of complaints. People from all walks of life, poor, rich, different, uh, different um, uh, professional groups and that kind of thing, all of them saying, here's what's going on in France right now and what I think about it. It's basically an early public opinion poll. It's a really, really fantastic source. So we have the cahier, and this is an example of what they look like. We have the cahier, the deputies get elected, and they carry the cahier to Versailles, where they're going to meet. Okay? Everyone's excited. There's a big procession. Go back to here. There's a big procession um, and lots of speeches. But very soon it becomes apparent that the Parlement plan is not going to work, this outvoting thing. You see, the deputies elected by the third estate are from that group I was talking about, the educated, wealthy financiers and merchants and judges and lawyers. The peasants didn't just elect, you know, Bob from over there to represent them. They elected someone who's going to be the spokesperson. So our third estate deputies are educated and they're aware of what they can do. They've been reading the criticism of the Enlightenment, and they've worked themselves up into a euphoric state about how this is the new day that is dawning in France. They are not going to stand for being outvoted, and they want a vote by head. So they want to have everybody in the uh, Estates General, all of the deputies, get to vote individually. And when the king agrees to simply double the representation of the Third Estate, so they get two votes instead of one, they don't agree. Now, Here's uh, what the opening of the Estates General looks like according to a contemporary thing. The second day of the meeting, the Estates General, oh sorry, excuse me, the third estate passes a resolution among themselves at their meeting, refusing to recognize the whole organization, refusing to recognize this three estate system, uh, but they're outvoted. So they try to get everyone to throw out the system. For six weeks, the three different groups meet in separate rooms. So we started here in May of 1789, until the middle of June, they continue meeting and strategizing and trying to get around this, uh, but they're at an impasse. Finally, on June 17th, the third estate decides to go on strike, right? And they make it impossible for any more work to get done until they get a fairer voting procedure. They declare that they have formed a national assembly 
not, they're not just the representatives of the third estate anymore, they're not just the delegates to the estates general, they are the representatives of the nation. New word, national assembly. Now, when Louis hears of this move, he orders their meeting place closed. The newly constituted National Assembly arrives. The next day of their meeting is June 20th, 1789, and they find the doors locked to the place where they've been meeting. They're determined, though, so they go look for somewhere else to hold their session because they're the new National Assembly, and darn it, they're going to solve this problem. Now, it's raining that day, turns out. Weather is often important in history. It's raining, so they try to find a place indoors nearby that's big enough to hold all of them. There's about 600 of them. And what they find is a tennis court. They find a big indoor tennis court. Um, and they begin their session with determination. They invite the first and second estates to join them. And a few of the more liberal-minded clergy and nobles uh, do do that. And this is a pivotal moment. They solemnize it with an oath, which has come down in history as the tennis court oath. Which is one of my favorite ID questions ever, because if students miss the, the, the lecture, they have no idea what a tennis court oath is, because they didn't hear the story about the rain. So the tennis court oath is where they swear not to disband until they have written a constitution for the nation. Okay, so they are going to be a national assembly, essentially a representative government of, of the country. They're going to write a constitution. So this is right out of the Enlightenment, right? This is really a product of, of major change in the 18th century. All right. Now, initially the king did this. Remember, he's, he's not a very strong personality. but. By the end of June, he seems prepared to accept the status quo. He orders the first and second estates to join the National Assembly. So now we have a National Assembly. But he's got a trick up his sleeve. At the same time, he orders the army up to Paris and up to Versailles where they're meeting. All kinds of rumors are circulating. What is he planning? Are the troops part of a plot to starve Paris? That's a popular rumor. Uh, are they there to protect the king against evil nobles who mean to take the king far away where he can't be a good father to his people? That myth of the king as the father of his people and he doesn't really know what's going on. If only he knew, he would help us. That's still alive and well. Mostly, however, and certainly to historians, it looks like he's going to use force to break up the national justice. It looks like he's going to call in the army and, and just disrupt the entire thing. And also then to put down the rioting that's going to occur afterwards. So at this point, the National Assembly is saved by the lower classes of Paris, a group called the sans culottes, which means that they uh, wear commoners' clothes, not the knee breeches of the, uh, of the nobility. Unrest begins in a place called the Palais Royal. You can still visit it if you go to Paris today. It's a really nice sort of garden, uh, public gardens area with gravel on the ground, and there's shops and cafes and things that encircle it. And it was a lot like that today then as well. Uh, lots of places for conversation. It's a place that people went to hear the news. And news spreads very quickly when you go to the Palais Royal. So on July 13th, the people are heatedly discussing the military presence in the capital. What is the king doing? Why is the army here? Is he going to try to stop us? And this guy, Camille Desmoulins, he's uh, a lawyer, uh, 26 years old, long-haired and passionate, kind of a rebel for his day. He stands up on a table in front of a cafe and he shouts, to arms, to arms, defend Paris, defend the National Assembly. And he calls the crowd to follow him. So from the Palais Royal, a growing crowd forms. They march through the city. They create a general atmosphere of anarchy. Remember, this is July 13th. Uh, they attack customs stations uh, for weapons. There were, um, uh, because you had to pay all kinds of taxes to travel with goods. So the walls of Paris, for example, had customs stations that were uh, guarded, that had guards with weapons. So they go there to get weapons. Uh, they go to monasteries uh, for the food and wine, because after all, this is France. So you need wine if you're going to have a riot. Um, but they go looking for weapons and for supplies. Okay? And then the fateful day comes. July 14th, the crowd storms the Bastille. The Bastille is a massive prison. It's a fortress. And it used to stand right in the center of Paris. The reason they go there is not to free the prisoners. Uh, but because it was also used as a storehouse for weapons. Okay? Prisons, it, it didn't have a lot of prisoners in it, uh, but it does have an awful lot of weapons. So they know that and they go there. They do it to defend themselves and to defend the National Assembly against the Royal Army. But the significance of storming the Bastille is huge. First of all, we have a major social shift in politics happening here. The noble revolt against the tax reform has backfired, right? The Parlement 
tried to revolt against that tax reform effort by calling the Estates General, and it didn't work. The National Assembly was formed, and it completely derailed the process. The Estates General was hijacked by that educated middle class. It was a product of the 18th century. And now they've been supported at a key moment by the lower classes, the illiterate workers of Paris, who are going through the streets uh, looking for weapons. So we have the common people involved in politics. Another part of the significance is they're successful. Okay? The, 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 the storming of the Bastille is successful in scaring the king out of taking action against the National Assembly. So they are successful in their aim. The most important aspect of significance here is that it's symbolic. Okay? The Bastille was one of the first targets of revolutionary anger, in part because it was a symbol of absolutism. Okay? It's a symbol of despotic rule. This is a place, first of all, it's a big prison. It's right in their faces, right in the center of Paris, where the king can put prisoners. He can just put them in the, in the Bastille. Um, it has been historically before that a place where political prisoners were kept. So if you spoke out against the king, if you rioted, if you were seditious, the Bastille was one of the places that prisoners were sent. As it turns out, as I said, there weren't that many people in there. There were seven prisoners in the huge Bastille at the time that it was stored, stormed. And none of them were political prisoners anyway. Uh, four of them were in for forgery, one of them was in for incest, uh, and two were incarcerated for insanity. It had terrible dungeons. They'd been closed off for a long time. It is true that Louis XIV kept a man in an iron mask in the dungeons of the Bastille, uh, although his identity was unknown. It's very, very unlikely that it was a uh, mysterious twin brother, and he certainly didn't look like Leonardo DiCaprio. But the man in the iron mask did exist. That kind of myth, uh, though, that, that imprisoning of someone secretly, okay, that's the kind of myth of the Bastille that's still very much alive in the minds of the people in Paris. Okay, so the events of the early revolution are hugely significant for French history and also for the people of France today. Bastille Day, okay, July 14th, commemorates this event for all of the reasons I've just described. It's the national holiday in France. It's the equivalent of Canada Day. And it's a national holiday in part because it's the first of a great historical tradition of the people in the streets taking politics into their own hands. Okay? French are like this now. Um, you cannot go to France for longer than about two weeks without running into a strike. When the French get upset about something, they take to the streets. Um, the revolutions of 1830 uh, and 1848, uh, the protests in May 1968 where students and workers rose up to protest de Gaulle's government. The French have a lot of respect for the voice of the people, okay, for speaking out when you're uh, in disagreement about something. Um, and if you look at this image, this is actually the Place de la Bastille. This is uh, Bastille Square. This big uh, monument is placed right in the center of where the uh, original fortress was. Okay. So you can imagine how central that is to Paris. Uh, and you can actually see off to the side, you can see a place where a few of the stones, one of the, some of the cornerstones of the Bastille Fortress still exist. So as you can see in this picture, which was taken in 1988, um, people are waving all kinds of banners and slogans. They're using a political gathering to communicate their own message. This has become a tradition in France, and it's very, very significant for them. Uh, last picture, I'll show you this is kind of a, a backpacker's preview. Um, when you go to the metro in the same place, so this is the, the metro that's named after Bastille, uh, the walls are decorated with murals depicting the events of that day and the events of the revolution in general. What's interesting about these murals is they don't show the dead white men of history. Okay? They don't show um, Robespierre necessarily. They don't show, they certainly don't show Louis XVI. They don't show the big names. They show people. They show everyday people and their involvement in that day. They show women and children and men who are poorly dressed, all of them fighting for what they believe in. So we still value that. All right. Now, the revolution is a complicated era. Okay? We have entire courses on the French Revolution. Libraries have been written on the French Revolution. What's interesting is they experiment with lots of different uh, forms of government. They try out all kinds of different political models. They really don't have much to go on. They've had an absolute monarchy for eight centuries. We start out with the first National Assembly, and I'm just going to walk through this, but I want you to know that, um, and I see what your, your professor says, but um, this is not the kind of detail I would expect from you. I just want to give you kind of an overview so that when you look at the reading, the words are a little bit familiar to you. So the first National Assembly, the one that was formed with the Tennis Court Oath, um, and they swore not to disband until they'd written a constitution. So 
So sometimes that first government is called the French Constituent Assembly, and because they are writing a constitution, so constituent. So we call it the National Assembly or the National Constituent Assembly. Okay. Um, after that constitution is written in 1791, it takes them two years. Then we move on to the Legislative Assembly, because at that point they are then going to work on the legislation that is going to found, be a foundation for the new state. That Legislative Assembly only lasts for one year, and that's mostly because it's been up against two big challenges. The first of them is that the king tries to escape. Okay? So all of this time they've been building a constitutional monarchy. They've had a constitution that involves having a king as a figurehead, having someone who uh, endorses the constitution, kind of like what they see in England, right? And that's a lot of the examples they're getting out from England. But in June of 1791, the king decides he's had enough and he tries to escape. He's caught, he's brought back. Um, but at that point, the idea of a constitutional monarchy is on fairly, fairly shaky footing. It's hard to build one when the king tries to leave. Uh, so that's one of the problems. The other problem uh, is that there's um, war. As of April 1792, uh, France is at war with, uh, with Austria and Prussia, and as a result, they declare a republic in September of 1792. That's why that legislative assembly only lasts for one year, because it was a government based on constitutional monarchy. Okay? Uh, after the republic is declared, the name of the government is the National Convention. And that lasts for three years, from 1792 to 1795. So we've gone from a very moderate constitutional monarchy, now we're in a republic. As you know, of course, there's a really radical phase of the revolution, that famous one that I showed you the clip about at the beginning, called the Terror. The Terror lasts for about 15 months, and it's a time when uh, power gets concentrated in fewer and fewer hands, and it's very, very radical, very left-wing. Interesting period, creative, creatively, but a lot of people lost their heads. Um, and lastly, uh, there's a period called Thermidor, which is uh, sort of the transition out of the terror. Okay? As I said, it's a 10-year period. We've only reached 1794. So what happens at the end is there's another government called the Directory. And this is a government that just uh, sort of bridges the gap once they take apart the terror and they dismantle all of the, the, the guillotines and all of the uh, courts and all of the institutions that were built by it. Uh, they have a directory, which is, a, again, a fairly conservative government. So, again, you don't need to know the details of these governments, but the idea that there's political experimentation. We're going from a constitutional monarchy to a republic to what is essentially an emergency wartime government with the terror, right? Because they're at war and they're trying to solve problems. Um, and then at the end, they go back to a much more conservative government, the directory, because they've seen what happens when power gets in the hands of some crazy people in 1793. Uh, so they want to allow only people who have something to lose to be in control. Um, what I'm going to focus on for the last part of this lecture is two questions. First of all, so what? I.e., what did the revolution accomplish that we should care about? Why is this important? And the other question I want to ask briefly at the end is what happened here? How did it go wrong? Right? It started out with such great intentions, they had some good ideas. How did we get to the terror? So in answering the first question, so what? I want to point out some of the changes that the revolution brought and the innovation that the revolutionaries showed in bringing about those changes. Now, in many cases, they didn't actually set out to completely change the system. They were presented with problems, problems that were left over from the old regime from the reign of Louis XVI. And in figuring out how to solve the problems, they drew on what they had. They drew on lessons that they learned from the critics of the Enlightenment. They drew on their own ingenuity uh, and passion and their ability to think outside the box. And they often created something new, which is one of the reasons this is such an interesting period. So if we start with the problem that caused it all, remember, the financial problem, the national debt. The National Assembly inherits the problem of the debt, right? I mean, it's, it's, the, the country is still in debt in 1789. In order to pay it down, they decide to turn to that wealth that they couldn't tax before. All of the land owned primarily by the church. Okay, so they decide to seize the church's land, up to 30% in some areas, and sell it off. Okay? Now on the surface, this looks good. There's lots of wealth and in the church, and a lot of people who could use some more land. And if the government can sell the land to those people, then they'll make some money, pay down the debt, and everyone will be happy. Unfortunately, it's not as easy as that. Because that land was there as revenue for the church. 
Okay? Peasants are working the land. They pay, t they pay sort of tithes and taxes and things on the land. That money goes to the church. And then the church would use that money to fund its activities. So that involves not only paying the priests and keeping up the churches, maintenance, but also education was paid for by the church, charity, <coughs> poor relief. All of these things were paid for by the church from the, the land revenue. Okay? Now, if you decide to take away that revenue, you have to pay the bills yourself. Education and charity become the responsibility of the state. The church is essentially converted into a government department where the priests become salaried by the state. This is unprecedented. Um, the government demands also that priests swear an oath of loyalty to the state. Fair enough, except that many of them don't want to do it. In the long run, this causes way more problems than it solves. Um, while they're waiting for the church lands to sell, and people just can't come up with a whole bunch of money for land, they issue paper money that looks like this to pay the debt. Uh, they're called assignats. However, people have never really had paper money before, and they don't really believe that those pieces of paper are worth the thousands of livres that they, you know, that they should be getting for their land. And so it immediately suffers from inflation. Okay, people don't have confidence in the paper money. And the government succumbs to the temptation to just print a whole bunch of it and pay off their debt. So that's a problem. The other problem happens with the clergy, because they force them to, to, to swear this oath of loyalty to the state, um, but they're saying, you're loyal to us, the French government, not to the Pope. Okay, this is a Catholic country. Um, and that creates a major divide, which is the cause of a civil war that then threatens to tear the revolution in two. So just by doing something really small, trying to pay off the debt, um, they uh, do succeed in some ways in doing that, um, they also succeed in extricating themselves from the control of the Pope and Rome, creating a secular state, which is essentially what we have today. It's very, very good. But it causes a lot of problems. So that's something interesting that they do. Another problem is the feudal regime. Okay? Many peasants in 18th century France are tenants. So they essentially rent their land. They don't own it. They pay a rent every uh, year. Um, and they have very little control over that land. They also owe huge amounts of taxes and dues, and this is all arising from the vestiges of the feudal system that existed in the Middle Ages. Well, in the summer of 1789, in the wake of all these changes, you can imagine the Estates General has been called, they've written up their list of grievances, they hear the National Assembly has been formed, and then they hear about the, uh, the storming of the Bastille. Well, guess what? They're not going to want to pay their taxes, first of all. They're, they're thinking, I'm not paying money if I have no idea who the government is right now. And they also start to feel panicky. They start to be afraid that there's going to be a backlash against the people. So peasants rise up uh, in fear of noble retaliation, in fear of brigands. Um, they strike out at all kinds of objects of their fear and loathing, um, the, the noble houses, uh, the church, etc. Faced with this problem, with the fact that there's widespread peasant unrest throughout France in the summer, the revolutionaries do what has not been done anywhere else, and that's that they abolish feudalism. So they officially abolish feudalism. They strike the, the entire uh, system from, from the books. And what that does is create social equality. Theoretically, all men are legally equal when feudalism has been abolished. So that's a huge, huge change, and a very creative one. A third one I'll mention here is the question of civil rights. Under the old regime, you could be imprisoned without a trial. Okay? You could be sentenced to death for merely speaking out against the king. Torture was still legal, although it was used less and less towards the end of the 18th century. In drafting the new constitution, I mentioned at the very beginning, the revolutionaries wrote a preamble, a list of principles on which their constitution was going to rest. And they called it the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. So this was written in August of 1789. In this document, we find the principles of our modern political system. And here the plug for me getting voted as the most important day. So, for example, freedom from arbitrary arrest in this document. Innocent until proven guilty in this document. Freedom of thought, freedom of belief, freedom of speech, equality of all men before the law. This is revolutionary stuff. This, is, this was not done anywhere else. We also find a statement in the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen that sovereignty, okay, the, 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 the sovereign power of the government, rests not in an individual or even in a group, but in the nation. Okay, national sovereignty spelled out. The people have power. 
All right. One last one on the, the changes stemming from problems to be solved is that the revolutionaries completely redesigned the map of France itself. Here, I didn't uh, bring a picture of that. But essentially, the old regime was a jumble of overlapping and confusing jurisdictions, uh, going back to the piecemeal way that the country had been built up from medieval times. Some regions had special privileges, some had special courts, um, they all answered to an assortment of different people. Uh, some people had to answer to several different authorities for the same topic. It was a mess. Okay? It was logically a complete mess. The revolutionaries solved this problem by completely redrawing the map of France. They literally sat down at the drawing board. They take about 35 provinces and create 83 uniform departments. They rename it. It's no longer a province. The administrative center of each department is designed so that it's no more than one day's horseback ride from any part of the department. So if you have a problem and you need to speak to someone in the, in the central government, in the administration, you should be able to get there by one day on horseback. So this is a principle of accessibility of government, that they're writing into the map of the country. Um, they put the political and the legal structure at the reach of everyone. Each department after this, no more overlapping craziness. They all have the same institutions, they have the same opportunities, they have the same rights, they have the same responsibilities. And they strip clean all of the old names from the map. So Burgundy and Provence and Limousin and Normandy, all of these places. Today we use them as regional names because they have a historical significance. But legally, those are, that's just what they are. They aren't the names of the actual provinces anymore. Um, they, these different departments are given names that are taken from nature. They're given names that are relevant to a local physical landscape feature like a river or a mountain or a marshland or whatever it is. And taking away all of those regional differences, taking away the, the old names and the old privileges that used to exist, they're essentially creating national unity by destroying all of the previous privilege and all the previous distinctions. So they're, they're really wiping the slate clean. That gives me a transition into the other part of this slide, which is creativity. We see a tremendous creativity in the new institutions that are created by revolutionaries, particularly in the later period. As I said, the terror is a remarkably creative period for all it destroys. So for example, they're very attuned to the needs of the common people. Okay? The years immediately preceding the revolution had brought a series of poor harvests. So the people go into 1789 already hungry and with a lot of expectation for change. And I mean actually literally hungry, not just hungry for change, but like they're starving. As the revolution gets going, the economy slows down. There's a lot of disruption. There's a lot of other stuff going on. The economy is not ticking along as it usually would. Revolutionaries uh, respond to hungry crowds with things like price caps. So they establish a maximum for basic necessities. That's very anti-capitalist, um, very anti the direction that eco economic thinking had been going at the time. Um, so government price controls, essentially. Uh, later in the revolution, in the more radical period, there are plans to put in uh, a basic social security. Uh, they even talk about redistributing wealth, taking the wealth of, wealthy, uh, of, of the richer part of society and redistributing among the poor, creating a more equal society. Um, people interested in the history of socialism should look back at some of the early ideas these people came up with. They had um, uh, an idea for employment insurance. They were going to have old age pensions for disabled peasants and disabled uh, soldiers and that kind of thing. Very, very creative, very innovative ideas. And let's not forget that by 1792, this is a republic, okay? a true republic. So no king anymore. Uh, and it had uh, universal male suffrage. So all men over the age of 25 could vote. Granted, not women, that's another issue we can cover on another day, but it's still the 18th century after all. But to have gone from the most absolute monarchy in Europe to a republic where all adult males voted for the government is quite an achievement, and this in about three years. During the revolution, we see political participation of the masses on an unprecedented scale. Political clubs start springing up. People get together to read the news, to hear about the decrees, to find out what's going on, to talk about politics, to understand the laws, to write petitions to the government for change. People getting involved in politics in a way they hadn't before. Um, and the popular involvement of politics often spills over into the streets. The picture at the top 
shows women on a march to Versailles in October of 1789, where they were trying to get enough bread for their families in the lineups at the bakeries in Paris, and they basically marched the 12 kilometers to Versailles and bring the royal family back to Paris, making a major political change, taking them out of their isolation at Versailles, putting them smack in the middle of where the mob can get at them. Um, more than one time, legislation is pushed in a more radical direction because people in the streets want it that way. Okay, so this is this is change uh, to have that kind of popular pol politics. And one of my uh, popular politics, I do have a point there. One of my personal favorites I mentioned at the beginning is the revolutionary calendar, and this falls under the category of interesting creative solutions. Uh, they want to destroy the vestiges of Roman Catholicism in society. Okay, the official state religion under the revolution, and especially under the terror, is called the cult of the supreme being. So they still acknowledge a supreme being. It's not God. It's not somebody to whom you pray. It's not someone who intervenes in society. It's a kind of deist religion, i.e. Uh, an 18th century sort of uh, cult in which um, you, I've already said, you acknowledge that there is somebody who has created the world because the world exists, so clearly there was a creator, but it's not it's not superstitious in any way. There is no, there's no magical element to it. It's just a very intellectual kind of religion. But to remove the church's hold from everyday life, to get the peasants to believe in this new religion, they redesign time itself. They realize how tied <coughs> up the calendar is in the Catholic Church, right? The seven days coming from Genesis, the seventh day of rest, the fact that um, January, February, all of these are... Um, uh, they come from, from, from religious references. There's many, many saints days and holidays through the religion. So they essentially take uh, the, and here's an image of the calendar here, they essentially take the calendar, the 365 days, and divide them up completely differently. They have 12 months of 30 days each, no more of this sort of 30 days, half September, April, June, November, and all of that. I mean, why would months have different numbers of days anyway? That's kind of ridiculous. Um, so they divide them up into 12 equal months of 30. They get rid of the seven-day week because of the religious reference. So they have a 10-day week, which of course annoys everyone who has to work because now they only get one day off in 10 instead of one day off in seven. Um, and they uh, take the five leftover days and they make sort of an end-of-the-year holiday where everyone parties for five days. That's popular. Um, and they abolish the saints. They, they rename everything. So when I talk about Thermidor as the end of terror, um, that is that's associated with the month of Thermidor, which means the month of heat. So that happened in July of 1794. Um, all of the different months here, you see Vendénia, Brumaire, Primaire, Nivo, Pluvios, they're all about the weather. So when I said that right now we're on the 20th of Pluvios, that's the rainy month. And in Paris it probably is rainy. It's a little bit nicer here. Um, so they, they, strip, they strip the calendar, this basic everyday thing that everyone interacts with every day of the week and they strip it and they, they create it anew. And the last thing I'll say about the calendar is they start renumbering the years. Okay? Because they don't want to have any association with Jesus Christ or his birth. So they say that the start of the revolutionary calendar is 1792, the beginning of the Republic. They, they call it the era of Republican liberty. So it's year one, year two, year three, 1793, 1794, 1795. They have the, the hubris, they have the, the, the gall to say, we have started time anew starts with us. So really interesting creative stuff. Okay, so if this is such a fantastic creative period, how does it all go wrong? How do we go from this? Remember this guy, Kim Dimuna, standing up on the cafe table calling everyone to arms? How do we go from that to this? Right? How do we go from uh, popular participation in politics to uh, the terror and the death of the king? So this is probably the single most discussed issue on the French Revolution. It's the one that makes the most heated arguments. And not only at academic conferences. You think that people have strong ideas about World War II or 9-11. In France, the revolution is still very much alive. Uh, people have personal feelings about which policies were good and which ones were bad, who the real counter-revolutionaries were and who was just doing a really good job and was misunderstood. Um, if anyone knows anyone who, you know, it was, had their um, relatives involved in the terror, people know about that kind of thing. The terror was a period of dictatorship and bloodshed uh, in which many heads fell, in which the enemies of the state were guillotined left and right and nobody was safe to speak their mind. Some historians 
have argued that the seeds of the terror were present from the start. Okay, that if you look at the, the sort of the ingredients in 1789, that you could see the terror coming from that eventually. To quote one historian, violence was always at the root of revolutionary ideals. He said 1794 was the same as 1789, just with a higher body count. Not very popular. The other interpretation is that the terror was the result of circumstances. Okay? First of all, before the Republic is even declared, and certainly before the revolution is on solid footing, they become embroiled in a foreign war, as I said. The reason for that war, there we go, is that uh, the rest of the kings and queens of Europe are about to step in, right? They can see what's happening. They can see that Louis XVI is not happy. And they're being called upon by him, by Marie Antoinette, to come to their aid, right? And they're afraid for their own thrones, too. I mean, if this revolution thing spreads, then they're all going to be dethroned and there's going to be republics everywhere. So the kings and queens of Europe of other countries are looking to, to step in and change things. The revolutionaries can see this brewing, okay? And they decide to beat all of these crown heads of Europe to the punch and declare war. So they declare war in 1792. Now, as far as executing the king goes, he did commit treason, all right? The papers are discovered in his possession uh, that demonstrate correspondence with the enemy, that demonstrate that he was calling out to the Austrians, to the Prussians, even to the British, even though they ignored him, um, because the British kind of thought it was funny that Louis XVI was having so many problems with his own country. Um, but he calls out to the Austrians and the Prussians, and he asks them to come to his aid. Okay? And as I said before, he does try to escape. In June of 1791, having left behind a letter that's reminiscent of, uh, of uh, Richard Nixon, he fled in the direction of the Spanish Netherlands, only to be caught uh, when a postmaster recognized his face from the coin. So the king is treacherous. We have a foreign war that we have to deal with. Add to this a civil war, okay, which is brewing in the West. Uh, the West of France, Brittany, sort of the, the area with the Celtic connection, um, is a particularly traditional area. The peasants are very Catholic. They're very attached to their priests and their king. And so there is a, a reaction against the revolution going on in the West. There's also a resistance of some of the departments in France, especially in the South, uh, what's called federalism, where they feel that the revolution is too central. It's happening too much from Paris. Paris is dictating too many things, and they're not listening to what we want everywhere else. The calendar is actually one of the examples they hold up. Because remember how I said that the months are about the weather? The months are correspond to the weather in Paris. If you're in Marseille, then the rainy, hot, dry season, all of those things don't actually apply. So they're like, they can't even, they don't even care about what our weather is like down here. They don't understand us. So in these circumstances, enemies within the Civil War, enemies from the outside with a foreign war, the threat that the entire revolution is going to be overthrown, the terror in that context is a sort of government for an emergency state. Okay? And it does manage things very, very effectively. It is an executive government of 12 people. It's headed up by this guy, our friend Maximilien Robespierre, who, for all his faults, because he was a bit crazy, um, was motivated by the desire to preserve the revolution, to make it work, to protect it. Okay? It's unfortunate that his way of dealing with those that he saw as undermining the revolution was to condemn them to death. That was possibly a little bit extreme. Um, and once the forces of the terror were turned on fellow deputies, once the people in the assembly were deemed to not be revolutionary enough, uh, it basically became a downward spiral that ended uh, in the execution of Robert 